This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and may I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Christine Graham to open the debate. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, I want to thank the many members, SNP, Green, Labour and Liberal Democrats who have signed my motion. And I am disappointed that not one Conservative felt they could support a motion which, after describing the horrors and indiscriminate cruelty of stink pits, merely asks the Scottish Government to, and I quote, consider the merits of banning the use of stink pits in Scotland, altogether on ethical, animal welfare and public health grounds. Someone asked me after putting this motion down what a stink pit was, and I'll be frank, until a few months ago and a discussion regarding snaring, I'd never heard of them. But as they say, you can knew. And I wanted to have this debate to educate and hopefully contemn to the past this, in my mind, barbaric practice. Briefly, the use of stink pits, also known as middens, is a fundamental part of intensive predator control in Scottish shooting estates. Gamekeepers are taught to dig a, quotes, grave and fill it with, quotes, bait, such as wildlife carcasses, fish heads and other animal remains, and to build low walls of brash and bran branches to direct foxes towards gaps where snares are placed. Snares are cruel and indiscriminate traps, which one kind, the League Against Cruel Sports Scotland, along with 76% of the Scottish public and myself and others believe should be banned. And I had the privilege of speaking in Colin Smith's debate on the banning of snares. Stink pits are designed to lure in and catch all foxes and other mammals in an area. Animals dumped in stink pits in Scotland since the introduction of the snaring legislation under the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011 include foxes, deer, whole salmon, pink-footed geese, pheasants, rabbits, hares and cats. The killing and throwing away of domestic cats is known to cause particular offence, as is the use of stink pits to dispose of mountain hares that have been culled in large numbers. But all of this seems far from, I quote, good hunting practice, close quotes. If you want to learn how to construct a stink pit, then I direct you to Midden's Fact Sheet, your guide to working a Midden stink pit for humane fox control ironically humane, on the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust website. I could also direct you to the many websites displaying graphic images of these disgusting exposed animal graves and images of non-predatory animals which also fall victim to the encircling snares. This is bad enough. But fundamentally, to pile animal exposed carcasses upon carcasses is of itself offensive. I recall the public being sickened by the sight of animal carcasses in vast funeral pyres during the foot and mouth outbreak. How would they respond to images of deer, foxes, pheasants, hares and cats piled one on top of each other? Where would be the regard for animal life? Let me give you some examples. Marchmont Estate, Berwickshire. A snare set by a stink pit containing a dozen pink-footed geese in October 2015 they were only protected between February and September, so shot it seems as soon as it became legal. Glen Turret Estate, Persia, June 2016. A cat in a legal stink pit. Leadhills Estate, South Lanarkshire. A young fox found in a stink pit with a snare around its muzzle. Three other snares were found around the pit. One was not tagged. There are images of badgers caught in snares and so on. Farmers, under the Animal Byproducts Enforcement Scotland Regulations 2013, are not permitted to bury livestock on their land other than in designated remote areas in the highlands and islands. Gamekeepers and land managers, however, are allowed to dispose of entire bodies or parts of wild game as long as this is, quotes, in accordance with good hunting practice, close quotes. I don't think that's a level playing field. Now, while I make no bones about it, I wish a ban on the use of stink pits on the grounds of animal welfare because they are callous and indiscriminate, public health, and in fact, because they're just plain inhumane. I have no doubt the public, once fully aware of their existence, will, as they do over snaring itself, the raison d'etre for stink pits, be disgusted and wish them banned. And I hope that would help persuade the government. 
My motion has that mild request that the government consider the merits of an outright ban, but I refer the Cabinet Secretary to my recent parliamentary question, question S5W09661, <coughs> which says, to ask the Scottish Government with reference to section 11E of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 as amended, what information it holds on A, the location of snares, and B, which animals were caught, and whether such information is in the public domain. As a former lawyer, I can't help going into this section to take some of the subsections which are per pertinent to the use of stink pits. 11E subsection 1A, the location of every snare set in position by the person which remains in position. This is where records must be kept. B, the location of every other snare set in position by the person within the past two years. Further down, subsection E1, the type of animal. Two, the date it was found. And F, such information as the Scottish ministers may by order specify. Subsection two in there. That is, you find the locations A, by reference to a map, or B, by other means, for example, somebody capable of identifying the location. You see, I don't know how many stink pits there are in Scotland. I don't know how many snares there are around them. I don't know if those snares are all legal. I do know they exist. And I think that the very least we require when tackling this subject, and I do agree with pest control, I just don't think this is the way to go about it if we had reliable statistics. And I look forward to other contributions. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and speeches of around four minutes, please. May I have Peter Chapman to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And I refer members to my register of interest. President Officer, I would like to thank Christine Graham for the opportunity to discuss the use of middens as part of a policy of controlling foxes on estates used for sport and agriculture. And I must say that despite spending my whole life living and working in the countryside, I have never come across a midden as described in this motion nor was I aware of what it was without doing some research. And that is presumably because I am a farmer and not involved in shooting. Now, I have no problem with shooting in the countryside and I realise it is an important part of the culture and the finances of many Scottish estates. But it is something that I don't participate, participate in. Middens are effectively an area used for attracting foxes and are baited using carcasses that are not fit for human consumption. They are similar, you could say, to deposits of grain used to attract rodents, where they then can be trapped and controlled. The difference is that middens use snares, not kill traps, which means that snares allow non-target species to be released. It must be said that I feel the motion is phrased in slightly emotive language and in doing so somewhat masks the truth. Middens are located in remote areas, well away from habitation and indeed well away from where non-target species are located. There is no point in locating middens where the very species they target will be disturbed or where domestic animals can be accidentally encouraged to visit. And the very fact that most visitors to the countryside and indeed myself, have never seen a midden, proved what is described above is basically correct. Now, to look at the issue of, of baiting, a proper midden is located in an area where target species can be naturally channeled, and as such, descriptions of piles of carcasses, I am told, is frankly incorrect and not necessary. In the same way that you don't need a ton of wheat to attract a rat, a small pile will do, for a midden, it would be the same. The yep. Christine Graham. I thank the member for taking intervention. Has the member looked at the images online, ratified of the use of the carcasses in middens piled upon each other? And secondly, does he stand by the statement that he likens carcasses of animals to grains of, grains of wheat? Well, Peter Chapman. <laughs> I mean, obviously, there is a difference there, but I, I use that uh, simile in, in that it is some, somehow to attract the, the animal that you want to control to the, to the site. 
Um, I haven't seen many uh, instances online, but I have looked online, and I accept that there may be occasions where carcasses are piled on top of each other. I, I, I can accept that. I just, I just feel that it's not always the case, and it's not necessarily to be the case. So, where are we? They, also, they will also use animals that have been culled and are not suitable for human consumption to go into these pits. For example, if deer car carcasses are damaged in culling or in poor condition due to ill health. There should be no examples of farm livestock being used because, as we rightly heard, it is illegal. The fallen stock legislation requires all, fallen, all, all agricultural fallen stock to be disposed of via an approved knackery, and to fail to do so would result in cross-compliance regulations being flouted with the real penalties that this could generate. And this is an area where I do have problems with these middens. Because in the past, farmers were allowed to bury fallen stock on their farms. However, as I say, this has been illegal for some time now. So I do wonder, I do wonder why open pits with rotting wild animals are still allowed. So, the whole idea of middens is that they are used to attract predators and then using legal means to control them. And I fully understand that some members may not like the use of snares, and I respect that. However, they are effective, an effective way, and if used by a trained practitioner, a legal form of control. Now, snares are not designed to kill animals, but to hold them. So this allows non-target species to be released and target species to be humanely controlled. And it is, of course, vitally important that in the, that, and in the rules around the use of snares that they are examined at least once every 24 hours. So thus, the suffering of caught animals is kept to a minimum. Some might argue that it would be better not to use middens and rely on the use of shooting. However, we do know that a canny old fox will never be seen during the day and will never stand in a light. Thus, middens are an important tool in the toolbox. And they are not used purely on intensively managed grouse moors. I am told they are used across many sporting and agricultural holdings, although, as I have said, I have never come across them in Aberdeenshire. I don't know um, if they're there, I just don't know. Could you wind up, please, Mr Chairman? Yep. To sum up, presenting officers, I do not believe there is any need for the government to consider the merit of banning middens. If folk feel that there is an issue, then it would be right to promote their proper use as part of the snaring course that is a legal requirement in Scotland. Thank you. I call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Colin Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, I'd like to thank Christine Graham for bringing this topic to the Chamber and also for her long-standing commitment to animal welfare. I only found out about the existence of stink pits very recently and accidentally as I was doing some research in advance of the recent debate on snares. I'm grateful that this debate has brought the issue more fully to my attention and to that of other members and of course the general public. But um, if our constituents were appalled by the indiscriminate and cruel nature of snares then wait till they get a load of stink pits which are even more indiscriminate and even more cruel and, quite frankly, disgusting. As we've heard, stink pits are quite simply holes in the ground where piles of putrefying carcasses are dumped and surrounded by snares. The putrid and pungent smell of the stink pit attracts other animals, which are killed by the snares, and then added to rot on the pile with the rest. An unpleasant and chronic cycle of inhumane death and decomposition. Not only are stink pits simply repulsive and barbaric, they're absolutely indiscriminate. Now, whilst I personally don't believe there can be any justification for the use of snares, the case is often made that precautions can be taken, such as sna setting snares on animal runs, which reduces, if not eliminates, the chances of trapping non-target species. Stink pits, by contrast, attract a wide range of mammal species, which hugely increases the already huge risk of non-target species being trapped in snares. Animal welfare charities report that they've found all sorts of animals in stink pits. Foxes, deer, pink-footed geese, mountain hares, otters, pheasants and even domestic cats. For this reason, with, whether you are for or against snares, there can be no justification for stink pits. If you're against snaring, then stink pits are a gruesome extension of a generally cruel and indiscriminate practice. 
And for the pro-sneering lobby, the existence of stink pits hugely undermine the arguments put forward about taking precautions to respect animal welfare and protected species. In addition to the direct harm caused to the animals they trap, stink pits also indirectly harm other animals, in particular sheep. During the summer, stink pits generate maggots and blowflies, which are a significant and expensive health issue to sheep. And as well as the clear animal welfare case against stink pits, there's also a strong public health argument. With stink pits close to areas accessible to the public or close to water courses posing a serious health risk to humans. It's shocking that there's currently no legislation or regulations covering stink pit usage in Scotland or elsewhere in the UK. But even if there was, I'm not sure that legislation or regulation could possibly sanitise or condone the use of stink pits. It's my personal opinion that they should be banned. Trusted animal welfare organisations are unanimous in their calls for such a ban, from the Scottish SSPCA to the League Against Cruel Sports and One Kind. Now, I appreciate there's big money in countryside sports and its advocates have loud and powerful voices, but when it comes to animal welfare, I'll stand with those who protect animals, not those who profit from their suffering. If recent weeks have shown us anything, then it's, it's that we can't rest on our laurels when it comes to animal welfare. If Theresa May had had her way last week, we'd now be seeing moves towards the reintroduction of fox hunting in England and Wales. Thankfully she didn't, but that near miss should serve to remind us that we can't take animal welfare achievements for granted and that we must continue to push for progress in the areas where little has yet been made and also protect against regressive steps. Some animal welfare debates can be nuanced with cases made on either side, but with the topic of today's debate, there's simply no case for stink pits. There is every argument against them, and all of the major animal welfare charities support a ban. They stink. It's time for them to go. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. Can I refer members to my register of interest, which shows I'm a member of the League Against Cruel Sports. Can I also thank Christine Graham for tabling this motion and bringing this important issue to the Chamber. As Christine's deputy on the uh, cross-party group on animal welfare, I know how passionate and knowledgeable she is when it comes to championing animal welfare, and that passion and knowledge were very evident again today in her opening speech. It's worth repeating just exactly what we mean by a stink pit or, or midden, because I suspect many of our constituents won't know uh, about their existence and would certainly be utterly appalled if they did know. As we've heard, stink pits are literally piles of dead animals, carcasses and fish heads dumped on the ground or in plastic containers which are then surrounded by snares. Their purpose is very clear. They are raw bait designed to lure foxes and other mammals towards snares laid nearby. At least Scotland's research has shown that in some cases dozens of snares have been found around a single stink pit. Unlike snares, there are no regulations or legislation covering the use of stink pits in Scotland or elsewhere in the UK. But just like snares, stink pits are indiscriminate, often luring non-target species such as badgers to the traps. Now, most people would think the presence of stink pits would be at odds with the disposal of livestock carcasses regulations as controlled by the EU animal byproduct regulations. As members will know, under such regulations, farmers in most of Scotland are not permitted to bury livestock on the land. But there is a derogation whereby gamekeepers and land managers are allowed to dispose of entire bodies or parts of wild game as long as this is done, and I quote, in accordance with good practice. It is clear from the evidence produced by one kind in League Scotland on the actual use of stink pits across Scotland that we fall far short when it comes to this good practice. Good practice would dictate that stink pits comprise of wild fish, rabbits, deer, gralic and dead foxes. However, the charity of one kind have found numerous examples of protected species on stink pits, in their words, killed and thrown onto the pile to rot, as well as domestic animals such as cats. The dumped carcasses are, are more often than not uncovered, and snares around the stink pits are often set in walls of branches, heightening the risk of an animal attracted to the pit becoming strangled or entangled. They are also sometimes found close to accessible public areas, heightening the health risk to pets, people and also livestock, given the prevalence of blowflies, which so often become a feature of stink pits in the summer months. Let me give you just more details of one of the examples touched on by Christine Graham of the reality of a stink pit in my own South Scotland region. Late last year on the Lead Hills estate, one kind responded to a complaint from a member of the public about a fox being caught in a snare. Unfortunately, the responding unit was unable to find the fox and in returning to the site the next day, found it with horrific injuries piled on top 
of a stink pit. The member of staff who found the fox said, it looks like the snare killed the fox by causing that massive wound. There were gobbets of flesh on the grass and blood and fur. The fox's eye was bulging out so much, which must have been due to being strangled by the snare. Presiding officer, stink pits are indiscriminate. They are cruel, they are stomach churning, they are unhygienic and they are antiquated. They have no place in a modern Scotland. However, stink pits are merely the symptom of a wider disease, and that disease is snaring. Perversely, the tightening up of the rules around snaring by the Scottish Government actually could act as an encouragement to the use of stink pits. The logistics of having to check snares daily could limit the number of snares, and stink pits could increasingly be used to draw animals to a few more easily checked sites, in particular on large estates. Certainly, when you read the guidance on middens from the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, they point out that difficulties of snaring means, and I quote, the midden technique is now widely used by grouse keepers. So whilst I would welcome a ban on stink pits, what we really need is a ban on snaring itself. There's no point treating the symptoms when you could get rid of the disease itself. It was a view I set out in my recent members' debate in this chamber, a view shared by three quarters of the Scottish public. Presiding officer, I say this with a great deal of regret. The failure of the government to consult on a ban on snaring, failing to ban electronic shock devices, this week's decision to, to favour the reintroduction of tail docking, and concerns that the government simply won't go far enough when it comes to banning hunt, hunting, all seriously undermine the credibility of the government when it comes to animal welfare. So I say genuinely, I hope today will signal a commitment that this isn't the case, that the government will work across this parliament with those of us who want to see a truly progressive approach to animal welfare, that today we'll hear that the government will consider a ban on stink pits and will at least consider a more thorough look at the animal welfare implications of snaring, which the recent Scottish Natural Heritage Review utterly failed to do. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too am grateful to Christine Graham for securing this debate on stink pits and for her work as convener of the cross-party group on animal welfare. Uh, recently, we've seen dispiriting performances from the Scottish Government on issues of animal welfare, but I remain optimistic that today we'll see a more enlightened approach and that stink pits will very soon be outlawed in Scotland. I'm too I'm particularly grateful to the League Against Cruel Sports, to the SSPCA and to OneKind for providing MSPs with their detailed briefings for this debate, especially at a time when the Scottish Government is keeping them busier than ever. Um, as Col Colin Smith has just highlighted, they're proposing the reintroduction of tail docking on working dogs against advice from vets. Every single professional veterinary body is opposed to this. Standing by while foxes continue to be offered less protection in Scotland from hunts than those south of the border and refusing to ban the use of snares despite the inability of these barbaric devices to discriminate between species with family pets as vulnerable to a slow, agonising death as targeted species. As has been highlighted during the debate, stink pits are filled with bait, such as rotting wildlife carcasses, fish heads and other animal remains, in order that the smell of decomposing animals can lure foxes towards the bait and snares set to catch them as they approach. As we've heard, both wild and domestic animals are regularly found among the piles left to rot, as well as protected animals, including mountain hares, badgers, and pink-footed geese. And animals found in pits also include sheep, deer, and cats, with a high probability family pets have been killed. Now, while farmers in Scotland, as we've heard, they're not allowed to bury livestock on their land, other than designated remote areas in the Highlands and Islands, gamekeepers are free to kill and dump piles of entire animal bodies or parts of wild game as bait to kill even more animals, as long as this is, and I quote, in accordance with good hunting practice. Now, I agree with one kind that this seems a far cry from good practice of any sort. Among the evidence provided by one kind, an example that further demonstrates how feeble current legislation is to protect animals from those operating shooting estates was that of a dozen pink-footed geese found in a stink pit in Berwickshire in October 2015. As the birds are protected between February and September, one kind conclude they were shot and dumped in the stink pit as soon as the season opened. I think this is gravely concerning. And I, along with 
one kind, the League Against Cruel Sports, the SSPCA and the, you know, supportive colleagues in this chamber. I'm determined that we continue to fight for improvements in legislation to protect Scotland's animals. And I see no reason for delay in banning stink pits. And I agree wholeheartedly with Colin Smith and others that we need to revisit the government's refusal to ban snares altogether. I think those who would defend stink pits do so on the basis that a profit is to be made from allowing people to kill animals. In my view, that is simply indefensible. I don't think I'm alone in saying that I prefer to see priority, to give, priority given to those who visit Scotland's countryside for many reasons, you know, to, to enjoy our you know, fabulous scenery, our natural wildlife. Visitors don't want to be confronted with piles of decaying carcasses surrounded by snares, and people are coming across these. People who don't go to, into the countryside to indulge a bloodlust that, in my view, has no place in modern society. As Ruth Maguire pointed out, many people were incredulous and horrified when Theresa May called for a repeal of the hunting ban. A civilised nation does not indulge in such pastimes. I fully support One Kind's call for the use of stink pits to be reviewed as a matter of urgency. And on behalf of the Scottish Greens, I urge the Cabinet Secretary to take the necessary steps to bring an outright ban on the truly barbaric use of stink pits in Scotland on ethical, animal welfare and public health grounds. Thank you. I now call Rosanna Cunningham to respond to this debate. Around seven minutes, please, uh, Cabinet thank Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I, of course, congratulate Christine Graham for obtaining this member's debate. She has uh, long taken similar stances on issues related to animal welfare and her persistence and consistency uh, required to be acknowledged and admired. Um, as I said during the previous debate on snaring four weeks ago, the use of stink pits or middens as they're also called is of course an emotive issue. So actually I do understand the use of emotive language uh, in this connection. I appreciate that the idea of rotting carcasses in a stink pit will be repugnant to many if not most people. However, it is the job of legislators to give careful consideration to how and why they are being used before immediately coming to the conclusion that they should be banned. People are asking why they're needed, but they do, I suppose, even in their comments, accept and understand that stink pits are being used as a way of maximizing the effectiveness of snaring as a means of fox control. They are used to draw foxes into fewer, more easily checked sites. Thus, they have the benefit of concentrating snaring effort and reducing the number of snares set in the wider countryside. They are legal as long as they don't use livestock, which are prohibited under the Animal Byproducts Enforcement Scotland Regulations 2013. As mentioned by Christine Graham, the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust does have a best practice fact sheet specifically on the use of stink pits in Scotland. This fact sheet is provided as a handout during the compulsory snaring training courses which people must pass before they're allowed to set snares and it clearly sets out what carcasses can be used for baiting the stink pit. I understand some land managers are trialling the use of alternative methods for stink pits. We will be interested to hear how these trials develop and whether their use can be incorporated in best practice. There is no evidence or intelligence that suggests that the use of stink pits encourages increased unlawful activity, such as the killing of protected species and domestic animals. If people believe they have such evidence or intelligence, it should be reported. All snaring operators must now use their personal identification number on each set snare which makes snaring operators more accountable to the law. It is true that stink pits will attract the interest of non-target species, such as badger, wildcat, and pine marten. However, there is no reason that a stink pit should catch a higher percentage of non-target species than a snare set in the open countryside. It is still the responsibility of the snare operator to ensure that snares are not set in close proximity to badger sets or otter halts where it is highly likely that they would in fact catch those non-target species. It is also the case that it is the responsibility of the snare operator to release unharmed any non-target species wherever it is caught. 
With regard to animal welfare or public health issues surrounding the use of stink pits, again, I hear the comments that are being made, but we have no hard evidence substantiating these claims. If people believe they can provide such evidence, I would strongly encourage them to do so. Now, a review of snaring was recently undertaken by SNH on behalf of the Scottish Government. As I indicated in my response to the members' debate on snaring in May, I will ask the Scottish Technical Assessment Group to look at the use of stink pits as part of their overall consideration of the snaring recommendations highlighted in that report. And the issues raised by members today will be brought to the attention of that group. If a review of their use... Yes. Christine Graham. I'm very grateful to Cabinet Secretary. I, I went through some detail about my parliamentary question. I'd like to ask, um, is the Cabinet Secretary aware how many stink pits there are in Scotland? That would be a start and their location. Well, I'm, Rosanna going, to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to mention that. The answer to that uh, is uh, at present I have no information about the number, but that will possibly be because they, they will, the numbers will change. Um, they won't necessarily... Uh, always uh, uh, be in the same place uh, over the same period of time. That is something I need to I check and I will come back onto that just in a minute because I was talking about uh, the fact that uh, uh, we're asking the Scottish Technical Assessment Group to look at the use of stink pits um, and if the review of their use did highlight any significant issues then of course we will look at their use including the possibility of introducing further regulation. I also recently announced a package of measures in response to the report on the fate of the satellite-tagged Golden Eagles, which included a commitment to set up an independently-led group to consider grouse moor management. I've yet to confirm details, but I would expect that the use of stink pits as part of predator control management would be within the scope of that group. Again, if the group comes up with proposals to regulate the use of stink pits, I will give them very serious consideration. And that means we will now have two separate groups looking at their use from slightly different perspectives, and I will inquire whether, if there, whether there is a possibility of establishing the extent of their use to answer the questions that's been raised uh, by my colleague. I hope members will accept that that is the proper way for government to proceed. Snaring is a divisive issue, but I am determined that it and its associated activities, such as the use of stink pits, should be carried out to the very highest of standards. There are currently only 1,571 snaring operators that have passed the snaring training course and have been issued with a snaring identification number by Police Scotland. And I do regard that as an indicator of success. There have been uh, prosecutions uh, of the misuse of snares. I again regard that as an indicator of success. Our position has always been that this is an operation that if it is to be done, requires a professional approach. It should not be undertaken unless it is really necessary and the operator is confident that they can meet the highest standard required. This meeting is suspended until 2.30pm. <laughs>